Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you have joined us. We're a group of people who like to talk about the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is a lesson prepared for us to study for the months of April, May, and June of 2014. This is lesson number nine in that series from May 31 of 2014, and it's entitled Christ, the Law, and the Gospel. Now, the Law and the Gospel, are those, uh, are those opposites? Um, how are the Law and the Gospel related? That's really what we want to try to focus on in uh, this lesson. And we hope that you have your Bible handy because there's a lot of Bible verses to look at. We hope that... Uh, you won't just automatically accept what we say here. Maybe we're misquoting something. No, we're, we'll try our very best not to misquote, but it's safer for you to look in your own Bible and be convinced by the Word of God as opposed to by something that we say. Having said that, let's ask, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with prayer. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your Word. What a wonderful thing that we see wonderful revelations in, in the scriptures that teach us about you and your love and your kindness and your graciousness and about the gospel. And what the gospel is, well, there seems to be some difference of opinion about that, but Lord, help us to see it more clearly, to understand it more fully is our prayer in this time together, is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. More than a hundred years before Jesus lived on this earth, there was a Roman poet by the name of Lucretius. And he wrote a poem on the nature of things. That poem got lost for, I guess, what, 1,500 years or something like that, and then it was rediscovered, and people looked at it and thought it was quite interesting. He strongly believed that by virtue of their being gods, think about this, by virtue of their being gods, now remember, this is a man who believes in many different gods, the gods would have absolutely no interest in anything human. How does that compare with what you know about God? What a contrast between that and the true God that we know about. There's only one God, and he cares deeply about what happens to us. Both his law and the plan of salvation show his incredible love for humanity. Well, is there a direct relationship between law and sin? Before you answer that, let's look, read a few verses. Look at Romans 7, verses 7 to 12. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Is that a relationship between law and sin? No. Is the law sinful? No. no. Paul says, of course not, in the strongest language he possibly can use in, in, in Greek. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, where does that come from? Which one? Ninth and the tenth. That's the tenth commandment. I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Now why would that work? How would it work? Apart from law, sin is a dead thing. I myself was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, that particular commandment, the tenth, sin sprang to life and I died. And the commandment which was meant to bring life, in my case, brought death. Sin found its chance and by means of the commandment it deceived me and killed me. So then the law itself is holy and the commandment is holy, right and good. And that almost seems like a contradiction in that last verse, doesn't it? He seems to suggest that law killed him, and now it says law is holy and just and good. Now, how can that be? Maybe he was trying to use the law to save himself, and that's one thing okay. it can't do. Is there a difference between the very nature and the Tenth Commandment and the other nine? Because One through nine are acts, mm -hmm. or prohibitions of acts. You can see Number that. ten is in your head. It only occurs in your, in your brain. I can't tell if you're breaking number ten. You can't tell if I'm coveting. 
I might eventually get to that, <laughs> depending <laughs> okay. upon some of your actions, but I really can't tell. But, but don't all commandments start with the mind? Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a question. What makes a sin sinful? Is something wrong or sinful because it is opposed to the very nature of reality? We talked about this last week. In a universe ruled by a God of love, or is a sin a sin because someone has declared it so? And of course, the words that we use, we talked about last week, are these laws of God descriptive or proscriptive? Well, let's take some examples. There are many laws on the record books of nations and states and governments here in the U.S., for example, that are foolish, even make us laugh. But no doubt at one time they seem to be necessary. There are even laws that are morally wrong. At one time in the United States it was a law that one must return an escaped slave to his or her owner. In some countries today there are things which are illegal for women to do, but are perfectly okay for men to do, like driving a car. Should, is there a moral reason why women shouldn't drive cars? Well, the way some... No, I'm... In some countries... Yeah, in some countries, it's, it's against the law. And there are some things which are legal to do in one country that are not legal to do in another country. In some countries, it is against the law to change one's religion. How do you feel about that? Ultimately, in the wider context of the great controversy, throughout the universe, sin is anything which destroys or diminishes our relationship with our fellow human beings or with God. Where do I get that? Romans 14, 23, which is the most basic definition of sin in the entire Bible, the last part of it. it Paul has been discussing whether or not it's all right to eat food offered to idols, and he concludes, but if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith, and anything that is not based on faith, and faith is a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a good friend, Anything that's not based on faith is sin. To put that in very blunt and very plain English, whatever takes you away from God is sin. Whatever brings you closer to God is faith. So does the um, sin, oh, excuse me. Right. Does, does um, going, away from a, going away from the law take you away from God, right? I've yeah, kind of well, kind of yeah. lost my thought there. Yeah. <laughs> so. okay. Go ahead, Joanne. Um, the first paragraph you read is Paul saying, "Sort of ignorance is bliss." That if I do not know the law, I'm I, I'm not sinful. Well, but when I know the law, let's 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 come back to that because that's, it, a very good that's point. confusing. Okay. That first. That's very confusing until you sort of understand what's going on behind the okay, scenes. Okay, so you're going to come to it. Paul grew up as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was sent by his parents, who undoubtedly were very rich, sent by his parents from his home in Tarsus down to Jerusalem to be schooled, to be mentored by the, the highest, the most powerful of the, of the scholars in Jerusalem at that time, Gamaliel. So you know that they had, I mean, this, you didn't get away with that just real easy. And Paul must have been a very intelligent being to be able, you know, I'm sure Gamaliel didn't just accept anybody. But he was specifically schooled by Gamaliel. And as a good Pharisee, he felt that by clearly, you know, I, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this sinner. You know how the Pharisees talked, that kind of stuff. He could click off, I didn't kill anybody today, I didn't commit adultery today, I didn't steal today, I didn't lie today, you know. He would go through that list and say, man, am I thankful I'm a saint. Okay. But then finally he came to the Tenth Commandment. This is after now he's had the experience on the Damascus Road. And he starts asking, you know, this isn't right. God is telling me I don't even have permission to think something wrong. I don't, I'm not talking about doing wrong. I can't even think wrong. And it made him angry. He says, does God have the right to mess with my mind? That's really what he's asking. Does God have that right to mess with my mind? And then he stopped thinking about it some more, and he says, hold on just a minute. Someday, God is going to take his faithful followers to heaven. 
do you think it would be safe for God to admit to heaven people who, in their minds, were committing sin? And the answer is no. Because sooner or later, what will happen? Action. Pretty soon, those thoughts will lead to actions, and we'll be right back in the great controversy again. So was that Paul's struggle yeah. in, in um, uh, giving God permission to control or to um, straighten up his thoughts to... Paul is saying the only safety is for us all to straighten up our thoughts. Yeah. God can't safely admit anyone to heaven who hasn't worked at least on trying to straighten out his thoughts. Now, how do we know at that point when somebody is safe to, to go to heaven? And that's the wrong question. There's no way we can know. God knows. We can't know. So... Are you talking about we, do we know ourselves? So or? how are we going to be able to Do I get permission Carrie? to judge you sitting around the table here? No, I don't. Well, aren't we going to judge angels? Well, when we get to heaven and God is willing to and reveals well, things to point, us. at that point, okay, when he reveals that point to yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So why did he consider coveting to be the worst sin? Would someone like to summarize that for us? Who, co who considered it the worst sin? Paul. It's not necessarily that it has the worst consequences, but ultimately it's the worst sin because... It's selfishness and covetousness. Basically, it leads to all other sins. It's the very fountain of sin. Okay? Yeah, Lucifer started. Yeah, exactly. And that's why our financial system came apart, is um, people coveting money? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, by contrast, maybe not by contrast, but l compare Deuteronomy 30. Look at verses 15 to 20. What do you think of these words? Today I'm giving you a choice between good and evil, between life and death. Now, is he making it pretty clear here? If you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I give you today, if you love him, obey him, and keep all his laws, then you will prosper and become a nation of many people. This is an ironclad guarantee from God, right? The Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're about to occupy. And what happens if God blesses you? You get everything. <laughs> you healthy and wealthy. Yeah. Healthy, <laughs> wealthy, and wise, right? Okay. But if you disobey and refuse to listen and are led away to worship other gods, you will be destroyed, I warn you, here and now. You will not live long in that land across the Jordan that you're about to occupy. I am now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse. And I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Can you imagine Moses standing up in front of an Adventist church today and preaching this sermon? Choose life. Love the Lord your God. Obey him and be faithful to him. And then you and your descendants will live long in the land that he promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what did they choose? Bow. Well, you know what they chose. <laughs> no, well, what? Know. What did they choose? They chose to follow the pagan customs of their surrounding nations and the, the nations that they didn't bother to drive out. Okay, the so. That they were supposed to drive out, which they didn't drive out. So looking at that at rec retrospect, mm -hmm. looking at that verse, mm -hmm. is it saying that it's possible? It's possible to do what God asks? No, that it's possible to follow like he said that they were going to follow. That he wanted them to follow. But it, it, it says that. Even though nobody's done it yet. Well, individuals have done it. Not groups. Have they? Yeah. There were 7,000 had not bowed the knee yeah. to Baal. Yeah. Well, these laws of God, aren't they descriptive? So if you live according to the laws, it's not necessarily that God blesses you if you obey him, but God is saying, if you live this way, things will go right for you. You won't be arrested. You'll be busy working and raising crops. You'll have food to eat. 
things will go right with you if you follow the ways that I have laid out. If you don't follow those ways, um, bad things will happen. The only problem with that, and, <laughs> and I, you know, that's what it seems to say. I have to remember where it says, and I may not be quoting it exactly word for word. Paul says in his letters to Timothy, all who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That doesn't sound like Deuteronomy 30, does it? No, it doesn't. But, but can, you, can you explain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was talking about a very different situation. Here in Deuteronomy 30, he's saying, I have spelled out to you in minute detail exactly what you're supposed to do. If you do that, you will be successful as a nation. You will be a witness to the whole world. You will be doing what I want you to do. And you won't get persecuted. And you won't get persecuted. You will be a, you will be a conquering nation, as, as it was under the days of David and the early years of Solomon. So they what, were. So they what? controlled the world from the Euphrates to Egypt. But the disciples did followed uh, what, what God wanted them to do, and they did not end up <coughs> a blessed nation. They ended no. up uh, martyred. In the days of the Christians, now Paul is giving a testimony to Timothy, an individual pastor, and he says, we now know that under this completely different situation now where we are going out as individuals into the vast world out here trying to spread the gospel, there, there's, there's someone out there and a whole group of his evil angels that are absolutely determined that we will not succeed. And they will make sure that if there's any possible way to, just as they did to Jesus, if there's any possible way for them, for us to, for them to defeat us, to discourage us, they will do it. Well, we also, history bears out that Moses was never persecuted either. Yeah. But going, coming back to Deuteronomy 30, mm -hmm. doesn't that sound like the first covenant? Well, no. The difference is this. The but, but after he says all that, they could come up and say, we will do anything you well, say. Okay, then that would be the first covenant. Exodus 19, verse 8, 6, I think it's 6, verse 6, and Exodus 20, verse 4, verses 3 and 7, three times the children of Israel, even before they had heard God's commandment, said, all that the Lord has said we will do. Right. Okay. Now here, God is saying what he will do if you're obedient. That's if different. you're obedient. If you're obedient. But they still didn't do it. No, they didn't. They still didn't do it. So I'm wondering if it's still... I mean, even back then when they said, I'll do everything the Lord says yeah. that they'll do, they were thinking that they were going to get blessings if they did everything what the Lord did do. So to me, it still sounds like the first covenant right there, that, well, that it's a section. Yeah, it, this is part of God. God, God is saying, here are the conditions. And our response is, we'll do it, and we can't. Doesn't that type of mindset cause, like when they travel into the other, I can't remember all of it, uh, the, the other land and everything, there were a lot of fruits and the land was this and that. And then they started thinking, maybe their God is better than the God. Maybe we'll go with, uh, pronounce it for me, B-A-A-L. Baal. Baal. And Baal. I hear Baal. <laughs> yeah. But that, maybe that's what, because that mindset of, you know, good things mean God is with you and struggle means that he's not. Well, why did God choose the Israelites? Mm -hmm. Good question. But they have, there's examples of, from all of the, practically every walk of life, every <laughs> sin that could be committed, those people would. Uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of a microcosm of the, of the yeah. whole world. Well, there's, there's some things we can say for sure. They certainly weren't the largest and most powerful nation in the world. So it can't be for that reason. It's also very true that it, they weren't chosen because they were all saints. They clearly were not. So we have to think of some other reason. And, yes, Dennis. Well, it was a favor to Abraham. Yeah. He made this promise to Abraham when, when Abraham was an individual without a without any, any offspring, mm -hmm. but he was able to cultivate that offspring into a large group of people 
the time of the Exodus, mm -hmm. a couple of million people who were uneducated, so they didn't have a lot to unlearn. Mm -hmm. They had been isolated from the pagans, mm -hmm. and so he chose them to reveal himself to this group of people through the prophets. Mm -hmm. It was a group of people that he could communicate with and work with. He was not able to do it with the antediluvians, mm -hmm. so he starts over. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't do, the children of Israel did not do what they were supposed to do. Yeah. And actually, they were supposed to be a witness to all nations around them. They weren't supposed to be a conquering nation. No. They were supposed to be an example and have the surrounding nations come to them and say, mm -hmm. we want to join you. you. You have a wonderful system. We want to join you. But that, of course, didn't happen. Yeah. Despite the prophecies in Micah and Isaiah and so forth, yeah. But, but God was able to reveal himself through them, through the prophets, mm -hmm. through his coming in person. Mm -hmm. So he did reveal to this world and to the universe who God is, what's he's, what he is like, and how he behaves. A trivia question. How many Bible, or were there any Bible writers that were not Jews? Probably Luke. 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 The only one who was not a Jew was the Greek physician. Okay. And he and Paul wrote, be, between them, they wrote most of the New Testament. So we have quite a bit of the New Testament is written by someone not a Jew. Yes. And Luke wrote only 500 words less than Paul. Something like that. Yeah. Now that's a real trivia question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One of the things that's interesting, let's just read a couple of verses. Look at Acts 10, verses 34 and 35. Peter began to speak. Now here he is in the house of, of, uh, of um, Cornelius. Centurion. Cornelius. Cornelius is what I'm trying to say. I now realize that it is true that God treats everyone on the same basis. Those who worship him and do what is right are acceptable to him, no matter what race they belong to. Okay? That was Peter's conclusion. That well, was a lot of relearning, was it not? That was a lot of relearning, yes. Uh, look at Acts 17, 26 and 27. Now here's Paul's comment preaching to the Athenians. From one human being he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they would live. He did this so that they would look for him and perhaps find him as they felt about for him. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. Okay? So what, what are we supposed to learn? Look at Romans 1 verse 20. Ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all even though, basically saying, even though they have not heard the gospel as we Jews know it. Where's that at again? Romans 1.20. 1 1.20. And I could add one more. Look at Romans 2.14. Upping down here a little bit. And I read, The Gentiles do not have the law, but whenever they do by instinct what the law commands, they are their own law, even though they do not have the law capitalized. I mean, he's talking about the Jewish law. Does that mean that these people are good and God's people, even though they don't know God's law because they instinctively follow God's law? That's There's what, something that tells them. That's what Paul is trying Verse to say. Verse 15, here. they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts. Yeah. Well, despite Israel's failures, we haven't spelled them out in detail. We hope our readers are as familiar with them as we are. God did not leave the people of other nations totally without hope. God is revealed in nature, and human beings feel an actual need for something beyond themselves. And all you have to do is talk to uh, someone who deals with counseling and stuff like that to realize the truthfulness of those words. By the way, just as another little aside, if you would be interested in the materials that we use in our study here together. They are available 
on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And we spend quite a bit of time trying to put together materials for the discussion of our class here. Look at Romans 1, verse 8, 18. What do you make of this? God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil, the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. People whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. Now, it's interesting if you go back to the verses, a couple of verses just before that, God's, I'm sorry, God, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, why would he say I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Think about our discussion about Christ dying on a cross, and then you hold him up as a wonderful thing, and they say, what? You mean someone who dies as a traitor to the Roman government is some kind of wonderful thing? How could that possibly be? You know, th think he's going, he's trying to spread that message to the people out there who have never heard it before. And then after talking about the gospel, just briefly, he says, and God's anger is against, and the first thing he mentions is people who misrepresent God. Right? Or well, the truth. That's, I, that's just about all of us from time to time. I, uh, it, look, go ahead. I read on the Pew Research uh, website, I do these, uh, keep track of their surveys for uh, the lessons, student lessons, the millennial generation, which is 18 to 35 or something, the uh, only like 23% believe that people tell the truth. This is the most, the lowest percentage of ever and the younger people just do not believe that people are telling the truth. So God says he doesn't like people who suppress the truth. It seems like our world has been doing that and people are aware of it and especially mm -hmm. the youngsters. So then when we come along with the truth, they're as skeptical of us as they are of everybody else. So this is a problem today, yeah, the big truth. Problem. Do we ever misrepresent God to our children? Don't anybody confess too quickly. <laughs> Remember that as parents, you are a God symbol to your children. They don't see God out there in the universe somewhere. They see you as God. And that ought to be scary. And to put that in a larger context, how well are we as a church doing at representing God to the world? Look at another verse, John 1, verse 17. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, there's something wrong with that verse. Does anybody know what's wrong with that verse? That feeds into the uh, belief that God is different from Jesus. Okay, let me turn you to the King James Version. Every once in a while, it's really good to go back and look at it. I'm reading the King James now, for the law was given to by Moses, comma, but, and the but is in italic. Now, is that, is that for emphasis? Why is the but is in italics? So is that. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And if you look down here, I have one of these very interesting situations where I have the Greek right down below here. And um, if you, if I can get to the right spot here exactly. So is the word but inserted? It, it is not supposed if to be If you there. look right here, you see the little word but? Uh-huh. And that, what's right below it? Nothing. Nothing. It's not there. It's not there in Greek. So the verse should read, For the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's not a contradistinction between law and grace. There was, not, there was never intended to be. How many sermons have you heard, but grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ and aren't you thankful that we're not under the law anymore? They could have put the word and. They decided to use but, but they could have used and. There's nothing there at all in the original language. Put in whatever you, I mean, if you feel comfortable doing so, you can put in whatever you like. Or just how about being truthful and leaving out the word? Yeah. Yeah. It was not God, John's intention to contrast the laws given by Moses to the grace and truth which came through Jesus Christ. Both the law 
which came really from God, but was transmitted to us through Moses, and the grace and truth which came directly from Jesus Christ are essential to our relationship with God. Each of us who has some knowledge about God is, res is responsible for sharing that knowledge with others. How well are we doing at that? Don't we share every time we do something? In some respects, yes. Well, let's be honest. Every one of us, I don't, this, I, this is not a surprise to anyone here, and I hope it's not a surprise to anyone in the audience. We are all sinners. By contrast, Jesus lived a perfect life. We've talked about that before. Um, maybe the best illustration is John 15, 10. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have done what? Obeyed. I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. And there's other verses, Philippians 2, 8, Matthew 26, 39, just as a couple of examples. We were shut out of the Garden of Eden because? Sin. The so sin of our first parents up there. The sin of our first parents. We now have the possibility of re-entering the Garden of Eden through the life, death, and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, how does that happen? Yes. What we call reconciliation, isn't it? Okay. We, we are back together. We, we, mm -hmm. We've been estranged. Do now, we... Now, now, through Jesus, we can come back together if we will pledge our allegiance to him instead of Satan. Yeah. It sounds like, though, when you come back to Jesus, you are coming back to the garden. Because yeah, sense, when, you, yes. when you got, they got kicked out of the garden, it was almost like a symbolically they were separated from God. Mm -hmm. So when you come back to Jesus, you are coming back to the garden. Do we understand? And this question is for you out there as much as for us. Do we clearly understand how Jesus' life and death have answered all the questions in the great controversy? We need to know those answers backwards and forwards. Let's look at some issues there. Romans 6.23, hopefully we're all very familiar with this. For sin pays its wage death, but God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, you asked Gary a while back, I think it was last week, you were asking, well, you know, are there really people who believe that once they accept Christ, they don't have to do anything more? This is one of the verses they would quote. Free gift, I accept it, thank you, Lord, now I can go on with my business. So Moses wasn't reconciled, Ezekiel wasn't reconciled, Daniel wasn't reconciled, well, they have a little problem with that. Well, what about these verses, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast <coughs> about it. You can't boast about a gift that you receive, can you? First, my, my question is, those guys that I just mentioned, yeah. we consider they were pretty fine fellows. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but Jesus hadn't come yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the reconciliation take place when he comes, or, or? Yeah, when, when sure. you believe in the promise, though, isn't it the same thing? Wasn't, didn't that happen to Abraham? And they, they believed the promise, and so they, yeah. they, they got the same thing as we get when we look at Jesus because Jesus was the promise. Gordon? As we read in Romans 1.20, I think it was, even without, no, even just through nature, people can know God. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, they knew God even better than through nature, through the prophets and so on. Once Jesus came, we have an even better, the best knowledge available about God and we have a better chance of reconciliation. So, in what sense is salvation a free gift? Well, we didn't earn it. It cannot be earned. There isn't anything that okay. we can do to merit 
salvation. Mm -hmm. how, how is salvation any different than just life? I mean, life is a free gift. Yeah. When Adam was created, he had no entitlement to be created. Eve didn't have any entitlement. There's nothing that has, there's no human, there's no toad, there's no cricket. There's nothing that has any kind of an entitlement to, to live from the outset. It's a, it's a gift. So how is salvation any more of a gift than just life itself? Or is it the same thing? Well, we wouldn't have life without <clears throat> God's gift. We can't possibly have salvation without His gift. So, yeah, in that sense it is. Let me just mention a couple of things. One, there are two reasons why it should be considered a free gift. One, there is absolutely no way we could do anything to save ourselves and earn our way to heaven. I mean, even if I could, even if I could give you a rocket ship and say, this will take you anywhere you want to go in the universe, which direction do you want me to point it? We wouldn't have a clue. We don't even know where to go. Now, some people said, well, maybe it's up there in Orion. There's sort of a hint. <laughs> you know? But Orion is millions and millions of light years you know, across. Where are you going to go in, in Orion, even if you get there? So, so there's, there's nothing I can do. There's not a lot of things I could do so that I could just walk up to the heavenly gate there with St. Peter standing there and say, okay, buddy, just step aside. Mm -hmm. I'm entitled to come through here, and there's nothing <laughs> well, you can, can do to keep you, me out. I can tell you that there was a pastor from another church that visited here a number of years ago, Loma Linda, and he says, you Adventists don't have a right. He says, when I get to heaven, I'm going to show the Lord my right to be there. They called wow. it a, and they called it a title deed or something mm -hmm. like that. Wow. Yeah. Well, the other reason why it's a free gift is God has already provided all the necessary answers and given us the necessary example to follow. There's nothing more that needs to be added, right? Nothing we could possibly do can add to that. Let, look at these words from Ellen White. It's in a little book entitled uh, Faith and Works. It was taken from manuscript number 36 in 1890, not long after the 1888 General Conference. Let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to affect anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. And of course she's using language which is very common to certain Christian groups. Should faith and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the creature is under obligation, I'm sorry, then the creator is under obligation to the creature. Well I think what Jay pointed out is pretty significant that in the first place life was given to us free yeah. uh -huh. and it sounds like all God's doing is renewing that free gift yeah. and but you have to be with the one who gives the gift yeah. so maybe life was given to us free but we have to choose the free gift of salvation yeah. Choose a free gift. And yeah, what is, what is free. What, what, how, do you, how do you make that choice? Okay. Here's, let me read on. She's talking about people who have this idea that somehow or other God owes us something. Here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. If any man can merit salvation by anything he may do, then he is in the same position as the Catholic to do penance for his sins. Salvation then is partly of debt. It would be that may be earned as wages. If man cannot, by any of his good works, merit salvation, then it must be wholly of grace, received by man as a sinner, because he receives and believes in Jesus. It is wholly a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy. And all this, and remember that was the big argument there in 1888, and all this controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled, that the merits of fallen man in his good works can never procure eternal life for him. You know, it, it, another way to, uh, to, that I've looked at this to kind of make it even, even more definitive is that using walking through the pearly gates, if, uh, when, you, when you go through those gates, let's say that's eternal life. That's when eternal life would begin again. Okay. Well, it would be like 
I could go up there and by my own merits, I could give myself eternal life. And I can't give myself uneternal life. Well, let's life is a gift from God and there's nothing I can do to give myself a little bit of life or eternal life. It's impossible. I do not have that power. Yeah. Well, see, the Christian church centuries and centuries ago used to basically teach that in order to get into heaven you have to have a certain amount of merit. And our lives are balanced like this and the evil deeds are balanced against the good deeds and if there's enough good deeds then they outweigh the evil deeds and you, you can enter the kingdom of heaven. But if you don't have <coughs> enough good deeds to outbalance the evil deeds, you got a problem. And you end up either going to purgatory or you pray for someone else who has extra good deeds to get those good deeds on your behalf so that you can make it into the kingdom. And that's how we came up with a lot of saints. They were pe a saint is someone who has demonstrated, quote, according to the church, that they have more good deeds than bad deeds. In other words, they have extra merits that they can share. By the preponderance. What? <laughs> By the preponderance of yes. their. <laughs> yes, exactly. Is function. this the parable Jesus taught where there was a man that hired workers and he said, Do you want to work for me? Mm -hmm. More or less, do you want salvation? And the workers said yes. And he started at the beginning of the day. And then workers came at the last minute and he said, Do you want to work for me? And he paid the, the workers who only worked a half hour at the end of the day the same as the worker who worked all day. Mm -hmm. and, and is this God's free gift to everybody? There's nothing you can do to earn it. And everybody will, who chooses salvation will get salvation whether they come in early or they come in late. But fortunately, the ones who are going to get God's gift of salvation are not going to feel about it the same way those people who worked all day did. Yes, they got <laughs> mad. And he says, no, no, don't get mad. Uh, we had an agreement. And, uh, but the point, the point is the, how much time you worked versus somebody else not working very much time. That's the big point right there. Well, yeah, well, well, you, and still and got, you still got the same pay. And if, we, if, we're, if it's a question of earning our salvation, then we're back in that same problem. We should be demanding. If we've been a Christian all our lives, we should demand a better heaven than people who just become Christians at the end of their lives. I'd, I'd, as, go ahead, Gordon. As Morris Venden made a point in a sermon about this uh, story, he said, the reward of those who worked all day with that uh, uh, owner of the vineyard was that they got to work all day with such a generous man. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There it was, should be an honor and a delight. I've often wondered if there wasn't also another comparison there, and that is um, part of the lesson here was the Jews have been with this, 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 this intimate understanding or opportunity to understand God for centuries, and now here's these Gentiles coming in, mm -hmm. and they're just brand new, yes. but the, the, the opportunities at, at salvation are exactly the same. It doesn't make any difference whether you've been a Jew for a long time. You can come in as a... Well, it's Romans 2, 14 and 15. Yeah. Is that why Paul, all of that we've been talking about the last several minutes, is that why Paul said, I am proud of the gospel? Or actually, what he said is, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why would he say that? And once again, we would say, here's someone who looks up to someone who was crucified supposedly is the worst kind of traitor against the Roman government and saying that person is the key to my salvation and his Roman friends must have said what was that you said you know I can just I can just see them Paul says 1 Corinthians 1 18 to 25 it was it was nonsense to the Jews it was foolishness to the Greeks well that's still today a lot of people today will say there's no God and we could say we're not ashamed of the gospel and of talking about God because, yes, there is a God. So that our world is the same. I, th I, oh. think, I, think sometimes, uh, I think sometimes we Adventists are ashamed uh, when we're all alone and we're looked down on. And sometimes we wish we weren't looked down on and we, or we're ridiculed for our beliefs, if, if that's a circumstance we're in, kind of. I kind of wish, you know, we didn't have to, there's a momentary <laughs> thing there, you know, I wish I, 
Wish I wasn't affiliated with this outfit. Suppose, or just suppose for a moment that you had a close relative or a close friend even who committed some horrendous crime, was put on death row, and ended up being, being sentenced to the electric chair, for example. Would you want everyone to know that this was your good friend or your relative? Well, if he died for a good cause. I didn't say died for a good cause. <laughs> I said he committed a terrible crime. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, we need to sort of try to think about ourselves. I mean, that's what they were doing when they were associating with Jesus. The world's view of someone who dies on the cross is, you know, he, he, he was sent to the electric chair. But he arose on the third day. And that's and what makes it different. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So they were worshiping a living savior, savior as we are now. And I'm sure, you know, when Paul, I, I, I'm looking forward to the day when we're going to be able to listen to some of Paul's sermons, listen to Peter's sermons. Think about him. I'm sure he built them up, says, you know, and here's this, and, and he died on the cross, and they're going, oh, no. And then Paul says, but three days later, he rose from the tomb, and they said, he did what? You know, <laughs> he, there, was first, there were two what's. First the awful what, and then the what? Amazing what, you know? He, he must have just as prophesied, and yeah. here's where it said that he was going to. Yeah. Yes. Well, to many Christians, the good news is that as bad as we are as sinners, we can be saved through the generous gift of God. Is that good news? Yes. Absolutely. But it's only the beginning of the story. Let me just, let me just put some things up for you. Satan has made a lot of accusations and claims against God. If God were the kind of person that Satan claims he is, not as he really is, but as Satan claims he is, would you even want to be saved? Well, let's think about that. Satan has said God is arbitrary. He's exacting. I mean, look at this. He threw Adam and Eve out of the garden on one sin. They did one thing wrong, very simple thing. I mean, is it, is, is it a huge problem to, to take a bite out of a piece of fruit? You know, God threw them out, you know. I'm sure they, Satan must have toured around the universe saying, I told you God was like that, right? So he, Satan claims that he was arbitrary, he's exacting, he's an unforgiving tyrant, he was even a despot. You can, you can get all those words right out of the writings of Ellen White. Would you want to be saved to live with somebody like that for the rest of eternity? Is, I wouldn't. Oh. Is it only Satan that does that? Because I think people do the same you mean, thing. You mean some of us might be a little bit like Satan? I think so. We, have, <laughs> we, have, we, we presented God in a bad way. <laughs> yeah. And we say things that we've created God in a certain way, and we say, thus said the Lord. And it doesn't fit. Well, in a, you know, in a way, when we... When we give up on God, mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah. So in that light, before we can make a decision that we want to be saved and really care about being saved, we better know the truth about God. Because if he's not the kind of person we believe he, we Christians believe he is, then we better think twice about whether we want to be saved. So that brings us to another major question, probably the last major question we'll have a chance to talk about in our lesson. Maybe not quite. We'll see how time works out. There's a big argument, and there has been an argument for generations among Christians about what some call special revelation versus general revelation. What is special revelation? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look at Acts 4. I see I'm... I, oops, sorry. I put this incorrectly in my handout. I'm going to have to fix it. This is supposed to say, go to Acts 4, verse 12. Sorry. Salvation, and here's the special revelation people quote this verse. Salvation is to be found to him alone. In all the world there is no one else whom God has given who can save us. So, how can we be saved? Through Jesus alone. 
through Jesus Christ alone. The general revelationists, by contrast, will say, look at Romans 1.20. Ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all. And then he goes on to talk about how they should be able to know God through all those things. Look at Romans 2 verse 14. The Gentiles do not have the law, but whenever they do by instinct what the law commands, they are their own law, even though they do not have the law. Isn't so does the through him alone, do we sometimes define that wrongly? Is the through him alone means that only Jesus makes the ultimate decision. It's not that because someone was born in another part of the world and has not heard of Jesus and they're them forever because it doesn't it wouldn't make sense that a loving God would do that well I'm telling you that there are even churches who say if you're not a baptized member of their church you do not have the ghost of a chance of being saved they don't know God now the special we have a lot of Christian friends who believe that uh, special revelation Jesus is the one that you can be saved through the only one and mm -hmm. churches teach that you have to you have to know him and you have to agree to him and you have to follow him and that's but the now, only chance of being saved general revelation seems to speak about God in other revelation ways other than directly through Jesus now that's kind of um, what do you mean by directly through Jesus? Through through creation, you can you can see God through um, creation. Is that what you were? Can you no, explain let me, let me between give, special yeah. and let me general? give you one other verse that might help? Okay. This is Acts 17. This is Paul speaking to the Athenians. Acts 17, 26 and 27. By the way, if you ever get a chance to visit Athens, make sure you walk up the hill and go from right downhill a little ways from the Parthenon, after you climb way up to the Parthenon, go down a little ways to the, um, to the, what? Mars Hill. Mars Hill, it's sometimes called Mars Hill, it's also called the Areopagus. Um, and where he, and, and the, the, these words in Greek are carved right in the rock there. From one human being, he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they would live. He did this so that they would look to him, look for him, and perhaps find him as they felt about for him. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. So if God is not far from any one of us and we can find him to these worldly things, maybe we don't need so much Jesus Christ exclusively. Does this, uh, when we know that Jesus is God, God is Jesus, mm -hmm. does this bring these two revelations together? Well, yeah, in one sense, yes. But of course, a lot of our Christian friends would say, no, we have a fixed gospel, and that gospel says you have to accept Jesus Christ, and if you don't accept Jesus Christ, there's no hope for you, and so forth. So you can't find Jesus in nature? Is that what well, they're saying? What they're, what they're saying is you can't find the name of Jesus in nature. If, no one ever, if, if you'd never heard of the Bible and no one ever talked to you about the Bible and you just went out in nature, you might learn a lot about God, about things in general, about good things and bad things and so forth like that. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't all of a sudden know that you had to come up with the name of Jesus. Is that true? Yes. Is so that? what is it then... What, what, what is it then that we have to carry to the world? Yeah, this, you this, only have three minutes to get us out of this hole we this, dug ourselves. This, 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 this mission of the church, we have okay. to, if we don't get we to have China, they're not, gonna, they're not going to make it. We have already suggested there is virtually nothing we can do to earn our salvation. So if salvation is a gift of God, how does he decide to whom he's going to give it? And if in fact people have never heard about Jesus, can be saved, why do we bother to send missionaries, or even evangelists, to try to convince them about the truth? There are many apparently contradictory ideas in Christianity. How is it that Jesus, dying a very shameful death on a cross, can free us from shame? If salvation is a completely free gift of God, why is it necessary for us to keep the law? Or is it? 
look at Romans 2. We've already mentioned that. What is the relationship between faith and obedience? Do we really think and act as if the gospel is the best good news that we have ever heard? Think about a time when you received some really good news. How did you respond? Do we tend to keep quiet about good news? Today I, I work with a young lady who has recently became pregnant. You know, uh, two, three months ago, something like this. But she just got the first ultrasound picture of her baby. And she was around showing everybody this granny looking black and white ultrasound picture of her baby. I mean, to her this is what? Good news. This is great news, yeah. It looks like a healthy baby in there. So, look at Romans 3, 1 to 4. We've got a couple minutes left. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Now, the Jews were the ones who had all the special revelation, right? The Gentiles are the ones who don't have the special revelation. So, Paul goes on, or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed, in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. And of course, their job was supposed to be to spread it to everybody, right? But what if some, some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. So the, the truth here that gets us out of this conflict is that we don't have to know specifically a certain thing about some event that happened in history. We need to understand that God's character is a character of love. We need to see that in the way a mother cares for, his chi for its child, whether it's an animal, whether it's human, whatever. We need to see love in all kinds of things. We need to see love in the beautiful sunrise. We need to see love in a beautiful sunset, etc. We need to see God acting in nature, and we need to be attracted to that, to be drawn to him. We need to recognize, and of course, as Christians, we would say that ought to trigger your desire to know more, and that more you should find in Scripture. I don't find these two supposedly opposites, opposites in, in contradiction to each other at all. Every one of those things should lead us to want to know more about the God who offers us this free gift of salvation. And I hope that's how you feel about it. Think about it yourself. Talk about it in your Sabbath school class. Thank you.